Hello everybody, I'm Noan, and today we'll be taking a look at the Any% percent Speedrun category of Dark Souls Remastered. For those unfamiliar with the Any% percent category, it is a category that uses glitches to beat the game as fast as possible. This run was performed by myself, but the current world record by Tomatama can be found in the description. If you are unfamiliar with the Dark Souls series, it is an action RPG where you go around collecting souls to level up, using bonfires as waypoints, and killing difficult bosses and enemies. To beat the game, the final boss has to be killed, but to accomplish this, the two bills of awakening need to be run, the lord vessels need to be obtained, and the four lord souls need to be procured from four lords. Before the run begins, there are some important things picked in character creation. Runs are done as male for the Ron Warp glitch, as the female idol animation cannot be cancelled. Ron Warp will be explained more later in the run. Thief is picked for the master key, allowing black fire bombs to be picked as the starting gift. That is it for the character creation. We immediately pick up the key and escape the cell. I switch weapons as it skips the acceleration animation at the start of a sprint. This is known as toggling and will be done by blocking with a shield as well later in the run. I pay attention to my stamina here so that when I get to the ladder I have a little bit left. Managing stamina is an important part of the run as time not sprinting is obviously slower. Speaking of not sprinting, I will use the ladder animation to menu as you cannot run and menu at the same time in this game. I open my inventory while opening the door and place my cursor over the left arrow here for a glitch later in the run. I will let you know when that becomes relevant again. The black fire bombs are used to quickly kill the asylum demon. I run over to this rubble and start throwing the fire bombs. I can get three off before having to roll. The demon does not drop the big pilgrim's key used to open up the exit of this level. Instead, he was killed early and Oscar is now holding it. Running up this hallway, there is an annoying hollow with a bow. The arrows can be easily strafed around, but as he starts to run up further, he can block the doorway. To prevent him from blocking the door, he gets pimp slapped. Coming up, I'm going to jump and perform a quit out next to a wall. This will destroy the breakable wall, as the standing up animation is destructive to prevent the player from getting stuck. This saves time from having to go up the stairs and bait the boulder to destroy the wall. Once I load back in, I will speak to Oscar to get the flask and the big pilgrim's key to leave the area. Heading down the staircase, there is a shortcut back to the open courtyard that leads to the boss room. Coming up, I will perform a quit out to skip the door opening animation. Dark Souls runs are done with end game time, meaning the animation while opening the door will take up time. Skipping the animation with a quit out saves time. Once loaded back in, I will pick up the hidden soul that most people miss before leaving the asylum. This run does not use it, but spamming the gesture menu when teleporting to Firelink can skip the intro text, allowing us to sprint earlier. I will make my way to Petrus to purchase some useful items. After the first dialogue with Petrus, there is an area of dead space where we cannot talk to him. This dead space is filled with a soul dupe. This dupe is a little complex and done quickly, so let me take some time to explain it. I open the menu, heading over to settings. I then hover over brightness, pressing A and then right bumper slightly after it. The timing is a little precise. We know it works when the brightness is over the inventory menu. After opening the menu, I will go down once and then hit the left trigger to bring me to the top of the inventory without moving the brightness menu. Now once I go back down to the soul, the brightness menu has brightness selected. Hitting A will now bring up a new menu under the brightness menu. This menu is the option when using an item and looks like this under the brightness. In this menu, if down and right on the d-pad are pressed at the same time, the selection will stay on use item but move the brightness menu down one. We want to go over to default as this is where the value of a prompt is stored. If no prompts are viewed since a load screen, the value is zero. This will allow us to select a 99. Now, let's see this in real time. That was quick, but now we have to spam through Petrus's dialogue being careful to select yes when the two prompts come up. Now we can buy some things from him, in particular the spells Force and Homeward, and then two talismans from him. Once leaving his range, the dark sign is used, this burns back to Firelink, and is a load screen. This will be useful as another dupe is performed shortly. I equip talisman while using the getup animation. 
On this elevator, we will dupe humanity to get 99 humanity. In Dark Souls, the amount of humanity can affect certain stats. What we want this for is the increase in item discovery as this run utilizes the Black Knight Halberd. Black Knight weapons are some of the best in the game, but only have a 20% drop chance. Humanity increases this drop chance, which is nice, as in a run, if it does not drop, it is an instant reset. Before reaching the bottom, I will equip the second talisman. I jump down and run towards the Valley of the Drakes. Typically, you cannot get in here early, but with the master key from starting as Thief, the door can be opened. I perform a nerve-wracking jump from one side of the valley to the other. I will pick up a soul resting under the talons of a totally dead undead dragon. Continuing on, there are some wyverns that I need to strafe around, as they could stunlock me with a lightning attack, killing me. I know which way to go by what attack is used. Past the wyverns up a slope is an elevator where an upwarp will be performed. This is extremely easy to perform. They consist of activating the elevator, stepping off, and performing a quit out by falling into the void below the elevator. Once loaded back in, I'm at the top of the elevator, saving a few seconds. I will light the bonfire before doing the third and last soul do of the run. This will give me enough souls to level up to meeting some stat requirements for the run. 12 attunement allows for both spells to be attuned. 20 endurance is to increase the equip load to meet the requirements for meme rolls later in the run. 32 strength is needed to one hand the Black Knight Halberd, and 18 dex is also needed for the Halberd. Lastly, 12 faith is needed to be able to cast force. Once leveled up, I will attune force and homeward. The Black Knight that drops the Halberd is right outside the cave. First, I will grab the Grass Crest Shield and quit out. This shield increases stamina recovery by 10 points per second, which is useful in a speedrun. Once loaded back in, I will attempt to cheese the Black Knight by running towards him, hoping for an attack that will cause him to fall off the ledge. This does not always happen, and sometimes I have to go in for a backstab with the fist. If the Halberd drops, we can continue on towards Andre the Blacksmith. On the way there is a Crystal Lizard that I will punch, and then I will kill with a Black Firebomb. Yes, the punch is necessary, or I will survive the Firebomb. A Tomb Queen Titanite will be used to upgrade the Halberd to max, but we still need 8 more. This will be achieved by using a Prompt Swap at Andre. I will open the Purchase menu. I have to move the mouse over the left arrow while in the Arrows tab. This is where moving the cursor from earlier comes into play. With the Steam Controller settings, I will switch over to a different action layer that rebinds X to left click and Y to E. I press X and Y at the same time. We know it works when the weapon tab is switched over with a lawn sword being bought with a quantity select. Typically, you can only buy one weapon at a time. With this prompt swap, nine lawn swords are bought. This will give one lawn sword with a quantity of nine. When we want to buy another lawn sword, the game tries to figure out if there should be a quantity prompt and what the max is to buy. To do this, it takes the max stack of the item and subtracts with the amount held. The game takes one, the sword's max stack, and subtracts the nine from the quantity of the sword bought. If you remember negative numbers, this will store a value of negative eight. Using quantity storage from before, we will instead target the Twinkling Titanite instead of soul. Negative 8 titanite is dropped, resulting in the game trying to subtract negative 8. Thinking back to math class, a negative being subtracted is a positive, so the game gives 8 twinkling titanite. There is an invalid dropped item that is left as it doesn't do anything. Now let's see this in action. With the 10 Twinkling Titanite, we will upgrade the Halberd to plus 5 before heading up to the bonfire. I know I just had to pause and explain a complex glitch, but we gotta do it again. We will be performing a Rond Warp, a staple of this category. This is where the Talisman spells are gonna come into play. There are different ways to Rond Warp, but we will be using the Homeward Rond Warp. When using the spell Homeward, it will bring you to your last bonfire rested. We will be using the spell and resting at a different bonfire before being warped. The game gets confused that you rested in a different area, but we're warping to another area. This results in the game sending you to the default failsafe position of the area being warped to. However, this cannot be easily done as the Homeward animation does not allow for anything to be interacted with. There is no spell with a short enough recovery time in the remastered version, so the animation needs to be cancelled with the effect not being cancelled. To do this, I will jump onto the railing, punching to avoid falling off. Then I line myself up on the railing to get a sloped fall instead of a straight fall. A glitch called Spell Swap is used. This glitch keeps the animation of the first spell, but will use the effect of the second spell. This is useful as the animation for Force allows us to fall with the desired slope effect. Perform this glitch in the left bumper and up on the d-pad are pressed together in one frame. 
In the very next frame, right bumper is pressed. This will get the desired effect of cancelling the animation, but not the warp. Wait for the loading screen to start to come up and interact with the bonfire. The last bonfire was in the cave where I leveled up, and its area is the Valley of the Drakes, which will default me to the bottom of the elevator that connects Firelink to the new Londo runes. Now that Ron Warp is explained, let us see it in real time. This warp saves us from having to backtrack all the way to just to go and kill Quaylog. Coming up, a meme roll or air roll is going to be performed. And Dark Souls Remastered when your equip load is greater than but not equal to 25% and below 29.1%, you can just roll in the air. When rolling in Dark Souls, there are invincibility frames near the beginning of the roll called iframes. We use these iframes to negate the fall damage as we hit the ground. The rolls have to be chained together and cannot be delayed. The first roll is what determines the timing of all other rolls. There are two ways I know the Blight Town meme roll perform. I perform a safer version by dropping off here and punching the ground. This setup is fairly lenient and I just spam the roll. The other setup is faster but harder. Rolling forward once, then followed by three rolls to the right. A slope is hit followed by a quit out. There is a glitch with slopes that prevent fall damage with a precise quit out. I suck at this and the timing is fairly tight, so I take the small time loss for a more consistent setup. Either way, we end up trudging through the Blighttown Swamp towards Quaylog's Cave. The swamp slows us down and applies poison which slowly depletes our health. There are also some large large guys with boulders who will try to hit us, but they are easily dodged. While entering the fog gate, we will switch to the Black Knight Halberd, skip the cutscene, and two-hand the Halberd, and then stun lock Quaylock. Turns out Quaylock can be stunned if you hit the human part of her body. When done right, it turns this fight into a cakewalk. With Quaylock dead, the first bell of awakening can be rung. Although Quaylock is typically the second bell someone would ring in a casual playthrough, the order does not matter, and both bells need to be rung. Once rung, we will dark sign to the last bonfire rested, which is in the undead parish where the Ron Warp occurred. This is great, as this is the closest bonfire to the next boss, Gargoyles. This boss is very easy, but getting there is a little tougher. I switch the shield over into my right hand and two handed. This is done to help push an enemy out of the way. The fist would work, but the shield significantly increases the pushback range with its running attack. There is a Balder Knight standing at the top of the staircase blocking the way. I run to one side of the narrow corridor, baiting out an attack. This will allow me to strafe around this knight and continue on to the next area. The room at the end of the hallway is full of hollows and a channeler. This is where the shield comes into play, as it will help push this annoying hollow out of the way. There are two ladders on the way up to the boss, so it's a good time to menu everything back into place. Now after running through the area, we can face the gargoyles. This is a double boss fight that typically gives new players a challenge. We two shot the first gargoyle. And then one shot the second gargoyle. We then climb up the Metal Gear Snake Eater reference. Once at the top, we ring the second and final bell of awakening before dark signing back to the undead parish. Conveniently, this bonfire just happens to lead right to Sin's Fortress, the next area we need to go. Sin's Fortress is a funhouse of traps and enemies. Typically a scary thing in a casual playthrough, but speedrunners blaze through this area like it's nothing. I time myself with the large swings of the blades to run through with as minimal stops as possible. The enemies can just be wrapped around here. At the top of the staircase are some more swinging blades, but this time with a guy hurling lightning at you. If timed correctly, I can avoid the lightning bolt. I still keep my shield up just in case. This guy is nice enough to leave a gap for me to slip by. Here, as I head to the outside, I tuck myself in a corner to avoid a scripted boulder that will knock the enemy out of the way. I continue on through a fog wall to find a pressure plate in a hallway that will shoot the arrows at me. These can be avoided by sprinting. I ignore the enemy in the room and take a right up the slope. At the top, I quit out to avoid being smashed by a boulder. Once I load back in, I find another hallway with another pressure plate and I just sprint for none of them hit somehow. The next set of four blades are placed very close to each other, but like most things in this place, they can be sprinted past. Up these stairs is yet another enemy blocking the way, but just punching him is enough to slip by. 
After getting by him, the last set of blades are dealt with by, you guessed it, timing a sprint. Passing through this fog gate leads to the outside section of the fortress. There is a giant with explosive boulders that will choke them out you. His throws land in a scripted location, so just sprinting by, he will not be able to keep up with you. There's only one fiend standing in the way of the boss now. This place is fairly dangerous. Must be something hard, right? Well, it's a guy with a crossbow and he's blocking a door. Like his doorman predecessors, he's just slapped out of the way. Now onto the boss of this area, Iron Golem. This boss is sort of a joke as dealing 400 damage to his feet will stagger him. And this is done with a single heavy attack. If another 200 damage is dealt to his feet, he will fall. With the right positioning, he will fall off the bridge, dying. I spend the time regaining the stamina to swap the talisman before running into the fire. The fire fades and I interact with a strange glowing halo. I am then transported to An Orlando. An Orlando is a stunning beauty that leaves everybody in awe the first time they are introduced. It is also an annoying area that is a pain to do in this run. Dying at any point in An Orlando if no safety bonfires are grabbed will result in spawning at the undead parish, since fortress and up to where you died would have to be done again. Here I am performing another meme roll to skip riding down the elevator. The time save here is minimal and it's easy to fail. The starting roll needs to be precise and failure means death. Once the ground is hit, I roll away and quit out. This is done as the death cam is active and trying to kill us while we are on the ground. Once at the bottom, another meme roll is performed, this one way easier. We will then head up the flying buttress. Yes, this is the required way to go. A jump is performed, aimed at hitting the railing of the balcony below to skip the landing animation. Through the broken window are some painting guardians that will throw daggers. We comp the ladders as daggers sail by. Once up, we have to sprint across narrow rafters with some guardians blocking the way. The first guardian will hopefully throw daggers and not block the way. The daggers are easily avoided, with backstabs having to be looked out for as they're weird. A risky jump is performed here by wrapping around the curve and jumping just before falling off. This jump is a little challenging, but there is another jump further up the rafters that is easier. After traversing the fog, I will look behind to watch for any pursuing guardians throwing daggers. Here I pull a lever that will operate this large platform that happens to be an elevator. There is a gargoyle in the way, but I feel like a broken record saying once again, we sprint past him. At the top of this grandiose staircase are two sentinels, but only one needs to be worried about. We are heading to the right and trying to run past the sentinel while watching out for attacks. The enemy has a sweep attack that can hit us if we run past that we look out for. Next up in the gauntlet are the imps. I dodge here as sometimes the imp will perform a lunge attack that could hit me. I will then keep the camera aimed behind me watching out for ranged attacks. Traversing down this narrow pathway does not leave much room to strafe the projectile so instead I choose to dodge it. Once at the bottom I pay attention to the next imp as this guy can actually hit me as I try to run by. I then once again watch out for lightning projectiles. Up next in the gauntlet is the infamous An Orlando Archers. The archer on the left needs to be looked out for as he will curve his arrows like in the movie Wanted and hit you. Once up, I move to the right trying to switch the Silver Knight into melee combat. Once he switches, I back up and bait out his lunge attack. Here he decides to meme on me a bit, so I quit out to reset him. This gives me the desired outcome and he falls off the ledge. Typically you have to traverse a fair amount of these rooms, but we're going to use some parkour to our advantage. Sprinting up the staircase, I stop to realign myself and jump over the railing onto the area below. This skips a majority of this area. I drop down from the stairs where an enemy is waiting. The Royal Sentinel is similar to its brother and I watch out for its sweep attack that I need to dodge. This boss fight is not a good time. Ornstein and Smo are one of the most iconic bosses in the trilogy. With the HP we have, most of their attacks are going to be a one shot. I'm hoping for the dash opener from Ornstein that I can avoid and punish. He won't always open with this, and even when he does, he sometimes bunny hops around. These small little ops also seem to have iframes. That is the reason we want to kill Ornstein, as once one of these bosses in the fight dies, the other one will consume them, transforming to the super version of themselves. Super Ornstein will jump around, prolonging the fight, while Super Smo is an easier fight.
There are two attacks I look out for in the super small fight. His shovel attack here does damage while he is running, so I run away from him until he gives up. I then punish his long recovery time with an attack. This is true with all of his moves. His second attack to watch out for is his butt slam AoE. This attack can one shot me if I don't notice it quick enough to get away from the large AoE. Here is what a good fight looks like. Once Mo is slayed, I take the weird spiral elevator up to receive the Lord Vessel. Here I don't manage to get onto the elevator in time. If this happens in a run, the only thing you can do is just stand and wait and cry yourself to sleep at night. Once we've reached the top of the elevator, we move towards Guinevere, opening up the door and performing a quit out to skip the door opening up animation. After quitting out on this door, I load back in and aim my head at the groin of the statue and throw a black firebomb. This destroys the illusion of Guinevere to obtain the lore vessel faster than talking to her. The dark sign is timed with the particle effects to initiate the teleport so that the cutscene plays before being teleported. This does not cancel the teleport and saves a little bit of time. We then immediately warp to Firelink. Here, King Singer Frampt is awake from us ringing the two bells of awakening. We punch him on the way down to have him disappear. His body has a collision that can delay the warp of the Kiln of the First Flame sometimes. Here we place the Lord Vessel, but Gwyn is on the other side of the door. We need to acquire the Ford Lord Souls to open it, or we could just run warp to the other side of the door. It works exactly as the first run warp, the only difference is changing the area to the Kiln of the First Flame. There are a couple black knights who stand in our way to win, but a secret tactic is used to avoid them. Sprinting. Most of their attacks will not hit as long as you know how to strafe them. There are a few times a roll is necessary though. Coming up, a combo is performed to kill Gwyn with a parry. Killing him with a parry results in a quicker death animation. His opener is parried followed by taking a few steps back and performing a heavy attack. Immediately a light attack is performed, staggering Gwyn. We bait his attacks until there is one that can be parried. After the parry, I will circle around him, two-handing the halberd, and hit him with a light attack. All that is left is one more parry and Gwyn is defeated. Let us see what that looks like. Just as the soul is received, a quit out is performed. The timing is tight as too late and the cutscene starts and too early Gwyn is not defeated so the fight gets reset. We are trying to use the unstable ground to save time. Any ground that is unstable will not save your position but instead save your position on the last stable ground. Boss arenas are considered unstable ground so quitting out in one puts you outside the fog gate. We are trying to quit out when the boss's arena was still considered unstable ground but Gwyn was defeated. This results in the game putting us outside the arena, but because Gwyn is dead, we instantly achieve the Dark Lord ending. This ending is achieved after defeating Gwyn, and instead of going over to the flame and linking it, you just leave. With that, the game is completed. And this is how speedrunners break Dark Souls Remastered to beat it in around 20 minutes. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe for more speedrun content. Thank you for watching.